All right, let's do a mic check. Anyone hearing this? Is anyone out there? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Is it too loud, or is it pretty good? It's good. Okay, cool. It's like clipping... It might be clipping a little bit when I'm talking a bit loud, so... Maybe a bit loud. All right, um, I guess it's start. It's uh, time to start. <laughs> it's starting to time. Um, let me know if this like background ambiance is too loud or not. But it should be should be pretty good. It looks like. Um, hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Some familiar handles in there. Always nice uh, to be to be back. <laughs> um, so yeah, today we're gonna just, um, I'm gonna go through all the the force stuff, the different instruments, um, and um, show a little bit 
Mac stuff, how they're built, um, behind the scenes stuff like um, probably probably the 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 Max portion going into that stuff, uh, the more like kind of uh, uh, in depth uh, content. I'm gonna go into that like after showing all the devices and, and how they work. Um, so the first portion portion will be sort of like a run through of the devices with some like live Q and A, obviously, and like you know chime in any time you want, ask questions, and um, yeah. Um, so yeah, and of course, like just let me know if there's anything you really want me to show or not show, <laughs> you know, or if I should just get a job or, you know, any, any type of good advice. Um, so, uh, obviously we've got Superberry running in the background, the good, good old Superberry. Um, so... I'm actually gonna switch over to a <laughs> job. Yeah, never get a job. Okay, <laughs> fine. Uh, I'm actually gonna switch over to Ableton because it's a little bit easier to um, to just handle things in in there, and um, uh, also has doublet and all the other stuff. Um, but yeah, obviously, I'm, I'm right now playing around with the standalone version, which runs inside of Windows and Mac. And um, feature-wise, it's it's the same. So when we jump over to Ableton, um, you won't really miss anything besides uh, the cute graphics. So yeah. Um, what do have to do? Mm -hmm. Have to close this down, it's a little da, da, da. Oh. <laughs> of course. Yes, yes, yes. Let's see. All right, so same thing here. <laughs> So yeah, we've got the Superberry running here too. It looks a little different, but it's the same thing. Um, for those who don't know, um, and at, at any point, let me know if the balance of things uh, are off because it's kind of hard for me to tell the volume of things. I can just go off meters in, in OBS and <laughs> those aren't great. Um, but um, basically Superberry is a synthesizer. Felicia and I came up with I guess um, this last summer, we were just talking about like how much we love uh, like trans melodies and super sauce. And, um, you know, kind of just um, talking about how that sort of sound sometimes can be a bit hard to access or like, you know, sometimes you just want that type of trans sound. You have these like dramatic, um, or like even melodramatic, I think, is what we were writing on the website. <laughs> um, these like very like heartfelt melodies with like these uh, dramatic plucks through a bunch of reverb and stuff. And there, there are a bunch of emulations out there, but they're all kind of, uh, they don't give you like that immediate um, super saw, uh, uh, Thing or like like <laughs> that thing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I'm I'm not a salesman, uh, but <laughs> so so. Uh, well, I mean, I kind of just was like, well, you know, how hard can it be, or whatever. <laughs> and I started building, um, started building these like. Um, um, these oscillators and trying out the patterns that the JP8000, which is this classic um, virtual analog synth that Roland made in the 90s, no, 2000, well, yeah, late 90s, that had this super saw thing. And it's essentially like this thing to si that kind of, you can say it simulates like this intense chorus like sound. And what it's doing is that it's using seven oscillators at once and detunes them in a way which just sounds 
you know, fat. <laughs> um, yeah, let's just listen to to what that um, what that sounds like real quick to get us a refresh. Um, I'm gonna turn down all the effects. Um, <laughs> that was a pretty lame sound. Um, gonna go into gated mode. So right now I just have to turn down the modulation and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, I, I tried to make it like really simple. You have like a brightness knob that makes everything sound really <laughs> bright. <laughs> Has a lot of overtones, rich sauce. Um, so yeah, if we just listen to that, um, um, we will just hear this um, this saw wave. <laughs> Apologies for the keyboard playing. It's a bit buggy in live when you're doing Max for Live stuff uh, in Windows. So sometimes you have overlapping notes. <laughs> and basically, when you when you turn the detune uh, up, you will start hear hearing this like chorus thing. Um, which. <laughs> which is like a very typical trance type sound. <laughs> um, and um, the, the kind of flip side of things in Superberry is that um, this is all just an FM synth <laughs> under the hood. And partly it's that because, you know, it, it was something that was known to me and I felt like, yeah, I could probably make like sort of virtual analog voices with FM because that's something I've been like researching before. Um, and uh, I just kind of made the core oscillators with FM, which has a lot of cool benefits. So the brightness knob is actually just turning down the, the frequency modulation. So, so when it's at minimum, it's just a sine wave. Um, and what's cool about that is, is it gives you kind of an, a unique control to to uh, to this like otherwise virtual analogish sounding synth, which is you know kind of kind of odd in a nice way, <laughs> and um, and it just gives you this extra palette to to play with, um, and you can also do you can also go into that and use the LFO as an FM operator. And I'll, I'll show that later. It's actually specifically designed for that too. So it is kind of an FM synth in, you know, uh, both an FM synth in in its core, but also actually, you know, in, in functionality too, <laughs> um, which is uh, funny. Although that's kind of like, you know, the outskirts of the functionality in a way. Um, and obviously the tune makes this, uh, cluster type sound and the the um, uh, original way of doing this it kind of went on to this maximum where it where it just had this intense beating and I thought it would be kind of cool if it went up to octaves after that so if you turn it up above like 80 90 percent it'll go into octaves giving this uh, more stacked type sound <laughs> <laughs> and um, in between there, <laughs> and in between those, uh, like 80 to 100, you get all these strange metallic-ish sounds because of how it tries to bend all of the oscillators towards octaves and stuff. So. Which is really cool when you actually use sine waves because it sounds much more like additive synthesis. Well, I mean, it is sort of additive synthesis, <laughs> um, but it just sounds kind of cool. And then you can mix that out a little bit and you get kind of a weird. <laughs> The kind of a bell thing, which is very weird for a super saw synth, but you know, <laughs> always good to be able to do things that are a bit uh, unexpected. 
And to pair this, <laughs> we have a sub oscillator. Um, and the sub oscillator is just, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It started um, as just like, um, yeah, so, so the mix for the super saw is between um, just the single oscillator and the cluster. Um, yeah, and the sub mix is between the sub oscillator and the super saw. And if you push the sub mix to 100, you'll mix out the, the super saw oscillator, which, um, you know, is just useful for um, a lot of modulation and kind of doing uh, um, like if you have an LFO and you want to kind of like mix between high and low in this interesting term, like temporal way. Um, but yeah, the sub oscillator is a bit more straightforward. Um, it's also FM synthesis making a, a square wave, a pulse wave, if you will. Um, and all of this, by the way, is tuned by ear. So it's kind of like the process has been like uh, increasing modulation and feedback until kind of things sound right. And then I have a little uh, high frequency boosting filter and all those things are kind of tuned um, for several hours until <laughs> they sound right, um, which uh, was really fun. Um, and what I think is very cool about the sub oscillator being FM is that it's got actual pulse width modulation. Which is a really particular trick you can do with about three operators, I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, it, it's, it's, the theory behind it is pretty strange, but Essentially, you kind of uh, phase things out with a third oscillator and m essentially make a gap in the waveform. <laughs> and then you kind of move that around uh, or like change the amplitude of that. And, and that just kind of move things. And then you kind of finagle where that uh, ends up. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool. It sounds, you know, it sounds uh, authentic. Um, oh, I mean, it, it really is pulse width modulation. If you look at it in a scope, it looks just like a, an analog. Um, well, not just like, but you know, <laughs> close enough. Um, and other stuff you can do with the sub. So it's got um, square wave and it's got triangle wave. And the triangle obviously is softer, but the triangle doesn't have pulse width because it's not a pulse. It has a a uh, little wave folder instead, um, which just makes it sound kind of metallic. Uh, you know, which is cool to just add some little glitter on top of things. And um, you can also fine tune the oscillator up to an octave above um, the uh, root note. And, you know, if you want to do the sort of thing where you have like a uh, uh, fourth above or stuff like that. Um, make them slightly detuned even <laughs> even there um, and uh, this wasn't part of the um, feature set from the get-go um, this was more something that was added later um, after some feedback and back and forth about like how things could uh, be added in a nice way. Um, and I also added a way to uh, control the brightness of the sub oscillator by the same knob. So essentially you can get kind of two sine waves to play around with. Um, <laughs> and um, this you can sort of control with the envelope. Um, 
So you kind of get kind of a SH-101 type thing. I mean, what's funny about the Superberry, it's essentially an SH-101, but like as a super saw thing, but also an FM synth, I guess. <laughs> you know, just to like put it in simple terms. I don't know. It's, uh, um, I, I personally really like the SH-101 and like always, I, I, f I feel that that's like... <laughs> I like to build things that are simple, and so does Felicia. So we always talk about like how we can approach instruments in a way that like every knob is kind of meaningful and um, doesn't like um, doesn't like detract from just like having fun or being in the moment or whatever. So the SH one hundred and one is like a great thing where it's like very um, you know one knob per function. You know where everything is, um, stuff like that. Um, yeah, and and uh, so this is kind of like that that similar feature set with like sub oscillator, oscillator, and uh, you know just just kind of keeping things very uh, dedicated and focused, which I think is great for um, when you just want to grab something and play around and and get some uh, instant uh, gratification type results. Um, and. This is all controlled with like a very uh, standard um, attack hold release envelope, which is a personal favorite. <laughs> um, and this, as I said, it can be, it can control the brightness amount. So you get uh, little plucks and stuff. And if you turn off the linking between the brightness of the sub -osk with the super, uh, super saw, um, You can essentially play around with like sharp and soft timbres or keep them both soft and uh, yeah um, this like keyboard thing in Ableton is driving me insane but I'll try and <laughs> try and uh, cope with it it's, it's basically just like dropping notes if you play around with a Maxwell Live device it's some Windows bug uh, <laughs> anyway um, if you're wondering why my keyboard playing is so atrocious today uh, that's why, you know, besides just not being, <laughs> um, and yeah. Okay. So, uh, there's also an LFO, uh, classic LFO, um, which you can route to most, uh, synth stuff. Um, typically fun things are the, um, like sub -mi mix where you can, um, You can kind of get this uh, combined timbre uh, dance, <laughs> if you will. Um, um, and this one goes into audio rate, basically. Uh, especially if you push it with this uh, note button, which will key track and also boost it to basically just follow the frequency of the oscillators. So now it's like AMing the submix, which is really weird, but it works. Everything is at signal rate, like the, um, the like DSP is, uh, everything is basically happening inside of the DSP chain. Which means that you can like do these crazy things that typically can get very noisy on a lot of hardware. Um, so on this one, you can really go nuts with LFO without uh, having um, too uh, bad of results. And <laughs> and the sine wave is sort of a special case where it just. Because uh, the other waveform is it filters a little bit to not get these edges, but um, the sine wave is kind of full force, so <laughs> um, uh, which lets you do really those kind of deep AM things. Like if you connect it to the volume, 
Um, you can use that as another uh, sound shaping tool. Say that we pull down the brightness of everything to get like uh, sort of um, like more sine waves. We get like a little AM voice. Um, and same goes for stuff like pitch, for example, which is um, a very special destination um, when you combine it with, um, uh, let's see if we can boost. Yes. Is that, is that better <laughs> volume? I think it might have been a little low, actually. Uh, I think this track is a little low. Um, Okay, cool. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, where was that? Yes. So the pitch destination, if you combine that with key tracking, um, you're actually enabling this hidden function that's face modulation. So it kind of doesn't connect to pitch at all. It connects to the face of stuff, which is how the whole synth works. So then you get um, um, an FM voice, basically. Let's, uh, let's just, let's say. This is a super classic FM stuff. And um, since the LFO also has a little envelope built in, you can do these kind of... Um, so it, yeah, it's like a little FM voice as well, um, which is, is uh, really cool and fun, and you can do really weird things. Like the sub oscillator will, of course, kind of stay at its frequency range, so... So it kind of just adds this, because like the, the sub oscillator will be still modulated by the same frequency, but will probably be a different octave. So it will get a different timbre and you can kind of play around with that. Um, and if you then throw in like maximum detune, which is also octaves, you'll get kind of like an interesting rich. Uh, Um, and then if you put it like in between some of these weird uh, octave-ish frequencies, you can really make it... Um Give it some really weird timbres and... Um So it really does go quite uh, crazy, <laughs> and um, it's it's, a, it's like at first it's kind of simple, but once you start playing around with it, it, it really does run quite deep. Um, and uh, there's also like a random uh, jitter generator in the LFO, which will just make a bunch of noise basically. And this one can be used in key tracking quite nicely to make. Uh,
like these broken sounds i really like that with with like noise silophos i made like making stuff that sounds a little broken it's like a favorite uh, of mine <laughs> <laughs> it's particularly broken. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so basically what the fade is doing is it's sort of a little envelope that every time the note is triggered, it triggers this envelope and the envelope just f makes it so that the modulation fades out and um, per each note trig. And this is kind of a concept that is uh, found in, in uh, a lot of the electron machines and some other synthesizers. And it's just a handy way of, of um, kind of giving some extra life to an LFO, which sometimes, you know, sometimes you want it to fade out or fade in or whatever. Uh, for example, if I do like a, if I have minus, it will, it will fade in um, the sound the modulation and it will probably start uh, it should s start being noisy after the the first trigger so to speak um. <laughs> it's, it's a pretty fast slow but uh, fast fade but you can hear that it it sort of the noise kind of comes in Um, I love these weird noisy sounds. <laughs> um, and yeah, exactly. It's, it's basically to just allow you to sculpt things further. And, and particularly in mind with like the, the sort of FM uh, aspect of the, of the um, LFO, um, it's just very handy to be able to... Um just make something that's that's really akin to an FM synth. And like you could also do uh, funny stuff like, um, like if, you, if you use the square wave and set the speed to like something super slow, um, you can... Uh, <laughs> it's not, let's see. Oh, and you have to, uh, this, uh, these little modes here, basically the lock does BPM sync, um, the note does pitch tracking, and the little arrows determines if the LFO is re-triggered per note. Um, so this is the synced mode, and if you do sync mode, you can make like a little <laughs> uh, pitch sweep. To make a not great bass drum, basically. <laughs> um, okay, uh, yes, let's uh, now look at the uh, effects section. This is um, something we that is also available over here, but we're going to talk about that a little later. But <laughs> uh, basically, this is a dual delay engine that we named Bokeh, and the idea for that came from. Uh, sort of being able to blur to like smudge uh, delay um, uh, the delay the echoes themselves and in my head I was like oh that's kind of like you know kind of being out of focus or you know because I mean I, I didn't just want to say like you know oh it's just diffusion in the delays and it's just like yeah sometimes it's just nice to try and think of things in a bit more um, abstract or like uh, <laughs> uh, yeah I'm losing the word here but basically it it uh, it's a very standard digital delay um, when you have everything in a very uh, <laughs> typical setting like um, okay <laughs> it's it's I, I try to make it as dry, like uh, just a very, very digital delay because I was also thinking about sort of the JP8000 and stuff like that and how that has this delay uh, that that is very digital and just kind of does 
you know, it just really makes a few delays of the sound and doesn't try to be a taped echo or anything like that. It just sounds very digital. And I, I thought that was great. You get, you get a lot of kind of interesting sounds from that with like faces lining up and, you know, something that is polyphonic, you will start to get like almost like a second melody coming in and things like that. So I wanted to, to make it um, very clean and very digital sounding, but with this like blur concept. And um, I think to illustrate this, I'm going to use the um, sequencer a little bit. So basically, right now it's just delaying like expected. Got like feedback to repeat the, the echoes. And there's a tone filter, which um, will sort of uh, remove bass or remove highs. It's kind of like a DJ cut filter. Which again, kind of inspired by um, those kind of like late 90s sounding stuff where, you know, people started using a lot of digital gear and, and uh, maybe the fidelity wasn't well you know it was it was it didn't like have any specific grit to it but it, they always had like some for me at least some interesting like um like sharpness to it or, or like this like kind of crystalline type sound and i i kind of wanted to capture that and the tone filter is also like very pristine in a way um but what you can do with this which is kind of where it gets really interesting is the blur. So the blur just makes everything sort of become more like a reverb. So then it just smudges every echo. And when you push it through it, it's extremes. Yeah, it's basically it's kind of like a reverb. And um, the reason why we have a dual delay, well, I mean, it's always nice to have two delays <laughs> to make like interesting rhythmical stuff, but um, they can also kind of be used in tandem in some interesting way. So the first delay is always mono and the second delay is in some way stereo. It can either be ping pong or sort of just a, a very wide stereo image. And the reason for that is because I typically work with a lot of reverbs, like, and I found it, I find it very, like, you know, when you have a couple of reverbs, it gets muddy very quickly. But for me, I've always found that if you have, like, if you play around with width a lot, um, like the spatialization of the reverbs, um, it really opens up this dimension that I think is, um, that just sounds very good. Because if you have, like, a bunch of stereo information, it just kind of gets lost. But if you have two reverbs, one being mono and the one being super wide, you can kind of play around with, uh, you know, EQing and, and, you know, volume and stuff like that. So um, this is sort of constructed with that in mind. So the second, um, uh, second delay um, will add just this stereo element to things. And um, it, of course, also has to blur. Um, and how the blur works there is, um, since it's like more of the stereo version of this, it will really push things into the reverb uh, territory of things. Um, but it's also nice to just have these soft plucks. Um, but if we push it really hard, it's just like a, it's a reverb basically.
Um, so yeah, now uh, now we uh, basically constructed these two different parts that we're playing around with, and we can do stuff like have different rhythms or different tam timbres or uh, you know, just play around with those different things. And you can also, also thank you so much for, for buying the trio. Really appreciate it. <laughs> um, and you can also send the first delay, delay into the second um, to just give you an extra thing to play with. Uh, and, you know, all of these um, deliberately aren't dry width mixes. They're all volume. So I can take out the synth voice. I can take out the first delay or the second delay, stuff like that. And that just allows me to build up this chain of, of effects or whatever and just make something that's uh, that's uh, just, a, you know, like a little world of sound, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Um, So basically now we're hearing the repeats of the first delay without a nibbler through the kind of crazy reverb delay, um, which which just makes this kind of re repeating pattern inside of this thing that's just trying to smudge it out as much as it can, which uh, is a really interesting sound, I think. And um, um, you can play around a lot with this and find different uh, cool combinations. Why is there no unison? Well, um, yeah, it's it's it kind of already doing unison in a sense, um, and since it already has so many oscillators, um, I think processing-wise it would be pretty heavy. Um, but yeah, I mean, also the envelope, since it's like always, always triggering, like you know, uh, uh, sort of like a dig attack or something like that where you have like an a triggered envelope it, it's more like a drum machine type thing but I personally really enjoy when you can push the attack and just let it try and reach the max every time it makes these kind of automatic pads almost Yeah, that's kind of the the gist of Superberry, um, and um, we later kind of broke out the Bokeh engine into its own Maxwell Live device, uh, which is a part of the Trio package of devices. 
and um, I've also got that running on the same <laughs> track, which I'm not sure how it sounds right now, but we could just get a sense of how much that could add, even if it's, so like it's, you could, you might think it's, not, it's the same effect, but it's really not. And it's pretty obvious once we turn this on, probably. That's with it off. So basically we just got some pitch tricks and a lot of cool stuff. Um, and yes, Super Bear is the only one with a standalone version. And that's what we saw in the beginning. And um, we are probably gonna do more standalone stuff soon, but um, that's always more tricky because you've got a lot of, um, basically a lot of things to, to uh, juggle and um, it's just a bigger project basically. Um, and yeah, you don't need Max to play this in Ableton, but you do need Ableton Suite or um, a Max for Live, um, what's it called, not license, but some other word used by, by Ableton, but um, yeah, it, uh, if you have a suite or the Max for Live add-on, you can just run it in, in live and it will open as a little device. Um, okay, That's, does anyone have any other questions about the Superberry or should we move on to, uh, to uh, the other devices? Let's, let's uh, see what's going on on the doublet uh, track. <laughs> focus a little bit from synths and move into sequencers. So what we've been driving all of this with is a sequencer we call Roulette. And this is another one of those things where I've spent a lot of time with a piece of 
hardware that I really appreciate and can kind of lose myself in or often for its, you could say shortcomings, but also just things being very specific. And um, a synth I really love is the MC202 and this has a very strange sequencer where you input a list of notes and a list of rhythms and um, well, a list of pitches and a list of rhythms. Um, and it uh, plays that back uh, kind of, you know, however you instruct it to, which is really cool because um, you get this asymmetric way of, of thinking about um, melodies and, you know, how pitch and rhythm sort of, uh, like in a melody, it, it relates in this very specific way, which I think a lot of sequencers, it's a bit difficult to get there sometimes. You, you know, when you have these 16 steps and you kind of fill them somehow, and sometimes that, that just, sound, just becomes a bit stale. But um, something like the MC202, which it, with its weird approach to handling notes, uh, I find it makes just for this uh, much more organic melody making uh, machine. <laughs> So, I just started thinking about that a lot and this idea of like entering lists and, and uh, um, what I ended up with was roulette um, and it's making this little melody right now. Which doesn't really repeat that often and that's part of the thing um, and I'm gonna load up a new roulette uh, just to um, oh, <laughs> just to get like uh, kind of show uh, how it works because it is it is kind of <laughs> strange um, at first uh, graphic bugs there it's kind of um, a little odd at first maybe but um, uh, it, it can really make these long evolving melodies and quite easily too. Um, so basically when you load it up, it'll just be a very standard, almost analog-esque sequencer. If I press play, we'll just get these <laughs> 16 step stuff. And if I uh, start moving the pitches around, Now obviously it's in chromatic mode, so it just kind of you know lands wherever you can see which which uh, pitch uh, you're landing on at the top here. Um, but uh, typically I, it's kind of built to load in a nice scale, and just you know be able to see this more as like do I want the pitch to be high or low, and do I want it to kind of you know go from point A to point B or like how more about thinking of how to structure, you know, a melody in terms of the idea of a melody rather than the specific notes that you have or whatever. Um, so now it will be in the Phrygian scale, which always sounds nice. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Um, and to our right, we've got the little trigger sequencer. And this is also as expected just uh, telling the sequencer when to send a note or not. And now that I've removed all of them except for the first, we'll only hear one 16 note trigger and then it will loop back. Uh, it will go through all the empty spots in the loop back. And uh, since these two uh, are right now symmetrical, meaning that this has a length of 16 and this is a length of eight, you will get a predictable sequence. Um, it will go through the notes in the order you assume they will, <laughs> basically. You can kind of look at the notes and get a sense of, you know, where, where is it playing. But um, what's uh, amazing and strange about roulette is as soon as you change the length of anything, you're in the land of polymeter polymeters and asymmetry. 
Um, so if I change this to seven, we'll now start hearing the melody take on, you know, it will, it will sort of uh, play in a very different way because it's, I'll explain after we listen. Adding a note. So what it's doing now basically is that all these sequencers are running. So the pitch sequencer is running all the time and the trig sequencer is running all the time. And when the trig sequencer is triggering, it's just looking at what the pitch sequencer currently have and sending that out. So essentially you get these different sequencers um, that overlap each other uh, depending on their lengths and that pattern can become really chaotic or you know if you do something that's you know uh, like uh, three by four or something like that uh, you know six against 16 um, you'll, you'll get sort of a more predictable pattern it's all about you know if it lines up mathematically if you use two even numbers you'll have stuff that lines up uh, more or if you use odd numbers you'll have longer uh, asymmetries basically and um, uh, this can be used to form a sort of almost like a sequencer behavior just making this crazy melody um, and as you saw when like adding if, if you have like just these straight uh, notes going in, in the length of 16 We'll start getting a pattern although it does line up differently but it's still like a pattern you can recognize very easily but as soon as you add something that will like not uh, it will kind of disrupt wherever it's grabbing the trigs When it gets even crazier is that we have these second and first transpose sections and what these do is um, they're also sequencers right now they're not doing anything because they're set at zero but if you set it to anything above or below zero it will take the current note and transpose it up or down according to that number so if i enter like 12 here we will now hear it an octave higher And these can be lists. So if I enter 0, 12, it will be every other note will be an octave higher. But only when they line up, because all of these are polymetric and asymmetric. So it's sort of the numerical relationship of each section when they line up, they will uh, you know, do these behaviors. So if I you know, have something that's two here, seven here, and 16 here, um, which means that you won't always hear this octave up because they need to like line up in the right way. And if I add like, uh, if I instead enter 057, for example, uh, we'll most likely get something much more interesting. And now we're really kind of in the borderline uh, for like something that could be called generative or algorithmic or whatever. Although it's it's still very much an ordered uh, way of doing things, but it's 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 you know the the mathematical relationships. Like if you think about when things line up, yeah, it will take a while. <laughs> um, and what's what I like to do with this one is, for example, copy and paste this a few times and then enter. A different uh, like 
one like say one repetition that's a bit different so here i removed a zero and changed the seven to a nine or like let's do ten maybe um and this will now you know kind of uh kind of skew it into a different direction according to you know these rules And, you know, then we have a second transpose, which does the exact same thing, but a second layer. We can enter the same sequence there. just really adds a layer of complexity to the melody and typically it's it's nice to keep these at different lengths so they don't line up and they just spit out this like nice melody and since everything's like in key it will just kind of you know just uh yeah so all the transpos transpositions and everything adheres to the key um everything is ruled by the mode basically the like uh, different scale modes uh if you choose one and um yeah <laughs> um so if i add like uh an octave here we'll throw it off a little bit Same goes for the pitch uh, knob. It will also just transpose everything, but according to the scale. And then we have a velocity lane, which it's basically the same thing but with velocity and we can make these little patterns with it. Um, uh And I mean, you can also enter velocity zero and that will, that will further kind of make a gap in things. And the div um, will, it's, it's a clock divider basically. This will divide the incoming pulse and basically just say that it's essentially like, if you think of it above zero, it will just count every number as many times as the div value and you know if you want to make something that's like more traditional transpose you could uh you could like enter zero three minus five and then a div of of 16 and it will it will start to kind of make the whole thing transpose uh after like 16 triggers So yeah, it's just the sequencer that's made to be just very direct, you know, kind of foolproof in a way, 
but then very deep when you start thinking about how it works. <laughs> and um, yeah, um, if there aren't any questions about the roulette, I guess I'll go on to talk about the doublet. beverage break <laughs> um, okay so as many of you know I happen to uh, oh yes probability <laughs> oh yeah there's another layer to this um, you can also enter percentage uh, before anything <laughs> and it will randomize that value up till that uh, thing so if I if I enter like percent there it will for each time it passes that number, it will go from zero to whatever number is there. So that just lets you introduce random into things, which is really cool. And like, since everything is uh, quantized to a scale, yeah, it will, it will always sound, you know, uh, within reason. <laughs> um, so yeah, and, and of course this percentage thing uh, works in the second transpose and as well as the velocity. And uh, yeah, it's just entering that and it will randomize per turn and it will be different random uh, values for each time, which is cool. Um, how hard is it, is it to name parameters? I, um, I find it quite easy. Um, um, I, I try to like make, I try to think about how this, like associate the sound to something and then just kind of go with my gut I think that's good. I think trying to play on associations and um, uh, you know thinking about sound as like an object or or a something that you can relate to somehow to something else kind of helps solidify it a little bit because sometimes it can be so abstract with sound. It's not you know something that's super tangible. Um, so I usually just try and think about what something reminds me of and just go for it. Um, and the development for the process for the roulette, um, I, I think I started playing around with it. I think I started, the idea came to me many years ago, I guess. But then I started playing around with this way of entering notes, like the lists and stuff. And then it just kind of came naturally, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, active, maybe like a couple of days, uh, but like inactive development, like a month of just like letting things simmer. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about some uh, some more FM synthesis, um, which is uh, a subject near and dear to my heart. <laughs> so, um, so uh, it's funny, I, <laughs> we were going to make bokeh and roulette sort of standalone, and uh, I was just like, I think I could just do an FM synth kind of quickly. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, Felicia was just like, uh, are you sure about this? Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> Felicia really knows how I uh, will uh, say that things will be pretty quick, but then they... Uh, they uh, it take a bit longer because I obsess about stuff. But um, I I did it in like a, a, a weekend, I think, like the, the core synth, right? Yeah, <laughs> which which was insane. So I, I, I was like, ah, I just want to make like this simple FM synth that doesn't like exist. And it would be really cool as an addition to like this Max for Life package we want to release. And I was like, in my head, I was like, I have this simple idea of just making a two operator synth and having wavetable stuff, which kind of makes it, you know, even if it's two operator FM, um, and I'm, I know I'm getting ahead of concepts here, but like, even if it's, you know, simplistic, 
it can make kind of a, a wide range of sounds. Um, so I, I made this two-dimensional wavetable oscillator, and this is something that's quite common. Um, and if you look at the waveform displays here, you see that we have an X and Y uh, knob. And these traverse different sets of waves. So if we turn down the modulation here, you see it's just a sine wave. Um, and once you start, so this is the first set of waves. Um, and when you turn Y, as you can see, it starts becoming more like a sawtooth. And um, uh, we have some different sets of, of waves here, like a square wave-ish um, and uh, some like classic overtone wavetables, just kind of like the classic, some bellish things. I, I, I tried to pick stuff that were, um, that I thought would work really well for FM. Um, and there's some like these kind of classic Yamaha style uh, rectified signs and stuff like that. Um, as well as some crazier things like bit reduced, uh, sample rate reduced sign and, and just straight up noise. So it, it, it just gives you this nice selection of waveforms uh, to expand the FM um, uh, set of sounds. And uh, the two dimensionality is of course these different, like you can see it as a bank, like the X would be the bank, like what type of wave and the the Y would be the sort of timbre or, or, or the different waveforms within that. And essentially it's just this long, um, uh, how it works is kind of cool. Um, I'm gonna try and show that real quick. Uh, da, 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 da. So it's this little wave, uh, this little, are, uh, let's see, uh, are the wavetables actual stepped waves or are they like the Uhe Hive wavetables which are created mathematically? Um, yeah, so um, th they come from this wave file which has all the waveforms in a long list. And um, essentially what the synth is doing is it's first playing here, but it can mix in this direction down towards these waves, but it can also mix between this point and this point. So that's where the two dimensionality comes in. So you can mix by these different uh, waves uh, in chunks of uh, whatever, and they're like sort of vertical range. And this is this is like classic wavetable stuff, but um, it's not something you see that often on, on, on FM Sense, unfortunately. But I think it's a really great addition. Um, so basically, uh, that just gives it this depth, even though it's, it's simple. Um, and uh, um, it also has this bend. Let's listen to the wavetables a little bit first. It's kind of a nice, um, it's a nice selection of waves. Um, let's see, let's see some comments. Um, will there ever be support to use your own wavetables? Probably not, um, because I kind of like to have this, um, you know, you kind of know what you're getting type thing. Um, I think we, I mean, I think it would be better to make a more dedicated wavetable synth in that case. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, and then we have the whole FM aspect. So, oh, and um, there's also this bend knob 
to further manipulate things. Which, you know, basically can be used to introduce, um, you know, a bussiness or uh, something that's close to pulse width, but it's kind of softer. Um, and one thing that's immediately special about doublet is that it has this mix thing. <laughs> and what this doing, what this is doing is actually mixing in the modulator into the signal chain when the modulation is at zero, which is kind of a very strange thing and <laughs> I think works quite well. Uh, so what happens when you turn off modulation is that it, it mixes out the oscillator but mixes in the modulation, kind of creating this natural progression. So let's have a little listen at that. It's a little bit more obvious if we change the ratio of the of the modulator. Let's do something a bit odd. So basically you get sort of a dual oscillator synth and an FM synth in one. Um, so if you want to like play around with just the wavetables and like, uh, you know, uh, detune them a little bit, you know, put this to like, a, uh, oh, this is not in sense, it's in some other weird thing, but. It basically becomes this two voice wavetable synth as well. Um, and of course, if you disable mix, you'll just hear the, the carrier. So the modulator could be used as a sob oscillator as well. Yeah, so that's kind of the basis of basics of the oscillator section. And FM as a concept uh, is pr probably something we should dive into this uh, this little show and tell. Like maybe I I hope to do some write up soon on the website on like sort of how the the like virtual analog stuff of Super Barrier was made and like some of these kind of more technical things. Um, but hopefully someday I'll I'll, I'll make some like proper FM tutorial more like, because I think that's still something people always appreciate. Um, you know, there's many ways to learn it. And I think um, I could probably help. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, um, what's something I always love when like doing FM stuff is to have oscilloscopes because it, it just really helps uh, seeing what you're doing. So when I turn off the modulation here, we can see that when we have a ratio of two, the carrier actually starts looking like a square wave. And what's essentially happening is it's a whole thing about overtones and the harmonic series, but it's sort of on the principle of if we look at this wavetable, um, when, when it looks like a square wave, um, um, we're adding, this is actually additive synthesis right here, this square wave. Um, what's happening there is that we're adding odd overtones. Um, and since the modulation ratio here is at two, um, which is like in the series of this or something, I'm really bad at explaining the like actual maths behind this. I'm, I'm much more of a practical learner, but, um, 
we can see that it's starting to approximate a square wave. Um, and as we kind of push the modulation even more, it kind of exaggerates that shape and it starts bending the wave with that pattern into like something that is quite coarse. And we get a, a bunch of different shapes when we turn the ratio uh, knob. So like one is more saw-ish. And two again is, is square. Three is, yeah, I don't know, uh, sort of also, it's, it's a little bit more like a pulse-ish. And four we'll get into sort of a more into the bell territory of things. And one thing to note about the oscilloscope is that uh, odd ratios or things that are kind of in-betweens don't actually show up properly as the waveform. And this is just due to kind of trying to keep the, oscill uh, the oscilloscope uh, face uh, correct, um, which is tricky inside of Max, maybe I'll find a better way to do it. But basically, it doesn't always represent everything super correctly, but just gives you a very good idea of, of how things are aligning. But if we listen to these different ratios, we get very different uh, overtones and timbres. You can kind of see how the amount, the number of waves on this side kind of correspond. You can see them reflect in the modulation, and that's you can essentially say that it's imposing uh, this modulator onto the sound. And another concept that's really important in this, and also like of course all the like bend things will have really interesting effects on on uh, on the actual outcome. And another interesting aspect of FM synths is feedback, which is uh, modulating the modulator with itself. And that typically makes things very sharp. So uh, if I do that, it will take on this uh, kind of sawtooth pattern and the uh, sort of squarish over here will start to sound much more richer. If this is pushed even more, we'll get into like very noisy territory. And one cool thing you can do with this is if you reduce um, the envelope a little bit, we can get sort of a filter-ish. So um, yeah, it just gives you this uh, kind of broad palette of sounds to play around with. And the envelope here is something that uh, I first came up with for the Electron Digitone, and it's an attack decay end envelope. And essentially it's something that I purposely created specifically for, purposely, specifically created it for FM. Uh, and it is essentially a attack decay, decay envelope like a slope, but you can control the floor of the slope. So with FM, you typically want like a pluck, but you also kind of want some modulation to remain. So it's not always just sine waves. Like if I had this, if I um, like always uh, had it uh, going uh, to zero here, as you can see on the plot, always sounds very soft at the end but as they increase and it will it will retain some modulation Just 
very useful uh, envelope uh, control. Um, and uh, all of this goes through a filter, which is always nice to have. This filter is very, uh, I would say, high quality. Uh, it just is meant to sound, um, just not really color things very much, um, since we have this sort of idea of things being, you know, ap unapologetically digital or whatever. <laughs> and. Um, It's got this interesting control called focus, which um, allows you to set the steepness, um, which is, uh, it doesn't have resonance, which I think is always um, interesting to try and do things that are a little bit different. So instead it's got this focus parameter, which is controlling um, how many poles are being used, how steep it is. And you'll hear that it starts rounding things off more aggressively as you increase that parameter. It's, uh, you know, if, if you have something that's kind of out of control on the, on the FM side, you can always tame it with a filter. It's just good to have. Um. Kind of same setup as, as the as a super barrier where you can send the envelope to the, the, uh, the filter as well. And on the voice uh, section, we have a unison uh, functionality, which uh, just adds a voice above and below the main sound. Again, from like slight detune, speedings to an octave. And it does like this super wide stereo spread when it's doing beatings. And as you approach an octave, it kind of modifies it. So it becomes like one solidified sound again. Which is just useful because if you have like one octave here and one octave there, and it kind of you know it gets a little crazy. So, um, and the LFO same as the same as the uh, Superberry basically. So I won't really go into depth about that. And we have a slope, which is an assignable envelope, and it's pretty straightforward. You can uh, assign that to all of these uh, sound parameters and increase the depth. Sorry, it was the wrong. And what this is doing right now is just this basically changing the Y. Uh, and the slope can be looped, um, which means um, uh, that uh, you can get kind of rhythmic. Uh, stuff from it. That's it for the doublet, pretty much. 
Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward as far as an FM synth goes, but it has a lot of depth to it. It's great for like any kinds of sounds really, but it focuses most on melodic stuff basically. Um, and uh, I think we tried to aim to keep this to two hours, but I think we're gonna go over <laughs> a little bit probably, <laughs> just a little, um, to show some of the max stuff uh, kind of quickly. I will probably do like a separate stream for more in-depth Max uh, idea or like Max, um, you know, how to's or whatever and tricks. Um, but I will also show some like uh, behind the scenes today. <laughs> um, okay, so let's look at Bokeh. And this is again uh, something we took from the Super Bear and made it to, into its own device. And uh, it's, it's very similar with the delays. Uh, does the voice section add in more processing? No, it, it always, uh, it's, it's always doing stuff basically. Um, um, and uh, so uh, the bokeh, oh. <laughs> The bokeh is sort of starts with those dual delays we built, but adds some things on top of it that I thought was uh, really good to have. So immediately there is a lot more controls. And yeah, I mean, obviously the, the look of these are very different. Um, uh, I'm not planning on releasing a doublet standalone version anytime soon. It's just um, kind of, uh, We'll, we'll see, basically. <laughs> um, so the Bokeh um, has kind of an extended feature set of the orig original built-in Bokeh delay. So if we just kind of uh, turn it up, it will be this... ...without the... As expected, just a regular delay, but we have immediately some something called spin, which um, which uh, will sort of introduce LFO modulation, uh, like uh, some automation uh, modulation of the time of the delays, which causes some flux uh, that sounds kind of like a chorus ish. <laughs> It goes kind of crazy up up towards the the hundred <laughs> percent. It's essentially kind of modeled after the idea of tape warble, but not modeled after anything really. Uh, but it uh, it sounds nice. <laughs> and uh, something that I felt would be really cool to have is a pitch shifter. Said and done, it's there. <laughs> and uh, as always, I kind of I like kind of very particular things about about uh, uh, everything, I guess. So, <laughs> so, so um, I work a lot with pitch shifters, but I don't like when they feedback and go up, 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 up. So I like when there's like a consistency to it and I like doing like a long reverb that is shifted. So when you turn up shift up to an octave. It will kind of retain there and you can push the blur. the feedback without it uh, kind of increasing in pitch for every loop which is uh, something I 
I like doing with pitch shifters, but it's not so common maybe. But you can of course press this button in between and it will do that uh, escalating thing. And again, we have um, a tone filter for this like uh, reduction of highs or lows. And it, it's kind of, it's, it's pretty much the same as the uh, Superberry Bokeh, but you can, again, as the um, doublet, increase the steepness of the filter. If you want that like super sharp cutoff to make it very, very like just high frequency content. And of course you can send that to the other delay and further process that in the same way as the, uh, as the super berry and uh, you know, just. With the volume all the way down on these, these are all just mixing into the final output. So there's no dry wet. You balance everything yourself, which means that you can like you can send this delay to that one, but remove it from the output, and you can also remove the the input from the total mix and stuff. Um, so it just gives you a lot of options how to layer things, basically. Um, and this drop down menu gives you a handy selection of delay times. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's kind of, you know, that's kind of the whole, uh, the whole shebang, <laughs> as my friend <laughs> Jenk would put it. Um, let's, I have uh, some pretty nice um, demo of, of uh, yeah, I mean, for example, the, um, the video uh, track we made for the reveal of the whole trio bundle is all really made in just one Ableton session with uh, just bokeh and doublet and uh, some roulette. And uh, it all just sounds really quite great. <laughs> And yeah, a lot of these things are a little bit non-standard, but I think uh, in this day, day and age, we need some non-standard <laughs> standard stuff. And um, yeah, as, as for CPU usage, they are typically quite high because everything is built in gen and uh, I want them to sound really good. <laughs> so so the max for live stuff is uh, takes a bit more processing toll than like a VST, which is a drawback. And 
Um, at some point, I would like to go through them and see if I can optimize them a little bit. But at the moment, they do use quite a lot of CPU. Um, yeah, but um, it's, uh, it's a bit tough with the Maxwell Live platform when you want to do stuff that has this type of this level of detail, basically. So here's the um, the video track running a bunch of bokehs, just you know. Oh, this is probably not audible right now. I need to change the master output. Sorry. Yeah, it can do quite a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I've 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 run it quite well on like a MacBook Air, uh, like a 2019 MacBook Air that's pretty bad in terms of CPU, and a new MacBook Air, the M1, which is amazing in terms of CPU. Uh, and uh, my main machine here, my Windows machine, is an i9, uh, 9900K. So that's kind of you know uh, <laughs> that really uh, gives it a lot of yeah, um, but yeah, this this little track is quite uh, quite uh, quite a nice way of showing off the range of the doublet, um, and especially like fun stuff like the bass modulation. Which is something that's like typically quite hard to do with like a you know, uh, a two operator FM synth. But when, once you add in these wavetables, um, you can really get it to those places, which I think is really cool. Um, and there's like some more percussive, which uh, has some modulation to make this uh, sort of evolving. Yeah, um, so yeah, and yeah, it depends on how many voices you use the CPU uh, draw. Um, it will it will not uh, process unused voices, uh, but for example, the unison on the doublet is a part of the voice, so. Um, <clears throat> All right, uh, let's let's open up one of these uh, little bad boys in in uh, yeah. I'm doing most of that automation in the Ableton lanes. Yeah, it's just a bunch of <laughs> uh, bunch of uh, you know all this stuff. <laughs> um, I think we should look probably. Like uh, just to show, the doublet is the cleanest one probably in terms of uh, layout patching, and I'm gonna have to add Max inside of OBS. Just a second. Uh, da, 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 da. Maybe it will even. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't look right. Uh, let's add. Yes. <laughs> here's my tiny Max window. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, here's here's the. Let's open this thing up. And uh, what takes to make one of these devices is quite in depth. Um, we've got a lot of custom UI stuff, um, which really adds complexity. Um, I'm gonna remove the Ableton backdrop for now. Um, 
so all of the these like the oscilloscopes are using they're basically just oscilloscopes and um all of this other stuff is JavaScript UI stuff, which I've written myself to kind of extend the library of, of uh, Ableton's built-in um, available. And sometimes they bug out like this, just lose color and stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, if we press uh, the presentation screen, we'll get to the nitty gritty. And uh, this is zoomed out 50%. It's basically <laughs> a huge, uh, patch uh, and all of this is um, uh, handling um, all of this is handling the uh, um, the controls. This is all the UI stuff. Uh, this this whole thing over here is the intro when when sort of it has the little boot animation in the in the OS uh, screen, <laughs> the fake little screen, uh, right? Uh, there, which is probably really hard to see, but yeah, this is this is kind of how big this patch is. It is huge, and how it's all done is using one gen object that is holding all of the synth stuff, um, and I am using what's called MC inside of Max to do polyphony, and um, this is a very nifty uh, thing they added a couple of versions ago. Uh, it's quite a long while ago now but it basically just allows you to to say this thing is multi-channel and um, you can then uh, dist like set it to this many channels and you can do stuff with the channels and that's how I'm doing polyphony it's really a neat way and also opens up for MPE possibilities which uh, hopefully is something we can add later on and all these little knobs are the like built-in Ableton stuff, but with its own knob rendering that I wrote. So if I remove that uh, JS Painter, it will turn into the standard uh, Ableton knob, which is pretty funny. Uh, so it's a lot of custom stuff. It's a lot of custom JavaScript to do the to do the J uh, to do the interfacing, and a lot of this is handling colors. That's a lot of stuff we have to deal with in Max for Live and. Um, um, yeah, I think if I open up one of these JS, I don't think they're gonna show, but um, it, it basically all come down. The, the side of Max is all just UI basically to present stuff, and all of the the like actual synth uh, things are happening inside this huge gen patch. So let's open it up. <laughs> let's go deeper. Oh god, this is a huge window. Uh, <laughs> just bear with me, I need to add this as well in OBS. Um, it should just be cool. All right. So uh, this is uh, absolutely huge uh, gen patch again. <laughs> uh, it's got the whole synth voice with all the envelopes and LFOs and everything. And for those who don't know Gen or Max or everything, anything, it's this visual language um, where you connect boxes together and they do math stuff. <laughs> and Gen is the version where it does it at audio rate. And this means that it does it, it does everything in this patch 48,000 times a second if you're running it in 48 kilohertz <laughs> sample rate. And that just allows you to have an extreme amount of detail uh, an extreme amount of control over things, so you can make things sound really good. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's a bit tough to just go into this and say, uh, this is how it works, etc. But I thought it would just be fun to open it up and kind of show some some neat little tricks. Um, I uh, I've been working with Jen extensively for like the past uh, the past uh for three four years and i think it's it's really amazing for uh making great sounding uh uh synth algorithms because like in in gen in um in the normal max uh sometimes you run into timing issues and stuff like that and this is just a, a way to like explicitly say that i want to do this exactly this every time, which is cool and uh, extremely useful. 
<laughs> and basically all of this is sort of handling inputs. A lot of these little boxes are just taking the input from, from the knobs we saw before and doing stuff with it. And um, one thing that uh, people, it's a common oversight in a lot of synths is interpolation. Like a lot of Maxwell AI devices that do synths are interpolation. So what that means is basically what we're doing when we're um, when we're going from the UI objects in Maxwell Live into this gen stuff and sending stuff to that, we're sending things at control rate, meaning that it's not 48,000 times a second, it's much lower. And this is to offload the CPU and it's not really necessary anyway. But this creates a problem with the synth where we get kind of a jagged input. Um, and that creates something called zipper noise, um, which is common on older digital synths where you like turn a knob and you kind of hear some overtones or some weirdness. Um, and we wanna avoid that. So we smooth out the input and that's it was this slide operator does. And this is something I do religiously and uh, it's extremely important when building synthesizers because you never want stuff to sound to like make little crackles or zipper noises when you turn knobs. Just, you know, that's my number one <laughs> little thing I can just say like that. Just think about um, those little details are very important and something I take very seriously. And I think is why, cause like a lot about sound making sound stuff sound good. It's not always so much about having a genius algorithm, which these certainly don't <laughs> it's actually pretty straightforward but the way you sort of make the interface elevate that synth engine makes things feel and and also sound good because sounding good is also uh you know in, in sort of a psychological thing where you know if something feels nice to turn and and sounds nice when you do it it will sound extra nice <laughs> And vice versa, you know, if, if you have an amazing sound engine, but the interface is bad, then it's not so great, is it? You know, if you don't want to like spend an eternity learning it and then get, you know. Um, the Digitone is not written in Max, but it was prototyped in Max. Um, nowhere near into this extent, although like something like the model cycles was uh, prototyped to this extent sort of where each voice of the cycles or each machine of the cycles had a Max for Live device that you could run that sounded almost like the hardware, but the hardware, uh, of course, has some, some uh, you know, nice touches. Um, hardware typically runs on, on higher level languages like C++ or something like that. Um, the Electron stuff is actually, all the DSP for that is written in assembler, which is machine code, <laughs> just to optimize things, which is crazy. But here we are. Um, so um, one thing I want to do a write-up on, on Forest again. Oh, I need to add this window as well in OBS. This is a bit tedious, but you know, it's not too bad. Here's uh, the oscillator uh, popping up, um, which is this... Um, this gen 2 w t <laughs> uh, that's sort of the core of this synth and uh, this is um, something I would like to do a write-up on Force and release as its own little uh, thing for people to reuse because I haven't seen that many solutions for wavetable oscillators in Max and it's it's very simple setup it has um, when you're doing wave table synthesis and you want to do this scanning between waves, you essentially just have several oscillators that you mix between. So this thing here called wave db on the line table, this is uh, an oscillator sort of, it's called a lookup oscillator that has a set of, it has a waveform that it's going through and that takes an input phase that basically gives it a frequency to scan through this wave and it's spitting out that waveform. And that's the basis of wavetable synthesis. You, in, you input a waveform, you scan through that this many times a second and uh, 
it spits out that waveform at that frequency. Um, and we've got four of these, and this is because um, we need all of those dimensions and the mix between them. And uh, X and Y mix this one oscillator out and the other in, and then as the other, the first one is mixed out, it also changes to the next table. So they're always like going in this, um, uh, they're spinning around each other always and, and switching wavetables when they're mixed out and back again. And, uh, it's something that was really made in like, you know, early 80s with the PPG wave and stuff like that, those old wavetable synths. And it's, it's fairly straightforward, but it can be a bit tricky to, to get it to work. So I, I, I'm going to release this as some sort of little code snippet and do a write up on force whenever uh, I, have a, I have the time for it. Um, I would I would say this is similar to the Korg wavetables probably. Um, it's a pretty common way of, of, of doing this. Uh, what's nice about making synthesizers and stuff is that all of this is fairly known knowledge uh, and exists on multiple papers and stuff like that. And essentially everybody has access to the same technology, but it's very different how you like decide to package that. You know, it's, uh, you could have, you know, if you look at something like the DX7 and compare it to a Digitone or Ableton Operator, stuff like that. The underlying technology is very similar, but the way it's packaged and presented to the user is extremely different. And so a lot of new synths these days are just different meaningful ways to use this technology. Um, and I mean, of course, within that, you can also find new way, new things to explore with these methods. Um, and uh, we probably have some stuff coming up that is like um, kind of jumping off of wavetable playback methods, but kind of um, in a little bit more freestyle manner. But yeah, this is sort of the core oscillator and it, it works by just looking where the knob is, uh, mixing in one oscillator and mixing out the other. And as it mixes out, it you know, kind of turns the page to the other waveform and goes through this list in the different dimensions. And it was it was uh, <laughs> it was tricky to to uh, to draw this up. <laughs> I um, I'm uh, not the best at like abstract thinking always, so I just had this big sheet of paper and <laughs> draw drew like the different waveforms and I wanted how I wanted them to go and just thought about like okay, I'm gonna need this many oscillators and. And uh, to get to this point, you know, it's um, um, it, it takes a while, of course. Uh, I think someone asked how I learn what each command does. It's it's quite tough. It's it is a it's a learning curve. And uh, you know, I think what's so great about Max is that you have built in documentation and help files and everything. And and even some parts of of our devices use stuff. Um, that's pre-built by, by Mac, sort of. Um, and, but, you know, parts of it, because, like, you know, a lot of this is about, as I said, packaging things in a unique way. And maybe a part of that could be useful. Maybe I modify it, usually. Um, but a great thing about Max is that it's, you know, it's available. Uh, uh, the the information is there since it's such a widely used software and you can build off of that um, and learning the different things Jen is a bit more Jen is a bit more uh, in depth where it's um, very specific to signal processing so a lot of the the a lot of the um, ideas come from like kind of hardcore DSP knowledge which is tough, um, but Max does make it easier to learn. And, you know, as you go along and learn stuff, um, you pick up these different methods that you then kind of know when to use and how to use. Um, yeah, this is, as I said, a huge patch. <laughs> um, maybe a little too huge sometimes. The LFO kind of handled here and a little matrix for the different destinations. Uh, which is probably a bit overkill, but this is, you know, as I said, there are areas I could probably optimize things, which one day uh, would be great. Um, 
the envelopes in this patch, um, I actually built them. I, again, this is some, uh, something that I think is very tricky, envelopes. So I built them off of an example by Peter McCulloch. Um, and this is available in the standard library of Max. And uh, I think we could look at this, for example. So uh, I have to add this window, uh, da, 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 da. window capture. Okay. Um, this is one of the envelopes. Um, and this is written in what's called the code box. And this is another cool thing with Gen is that you can go in and write code, which has a lot of benefits. Sometimes you need to do things that are very explicit in the order of what they're in, like the order of how they're doing it. And like, you know, when you want to say, I want to do exactly this per sample or, or, you know, you kind of need to, or it's, it's, it's easier to instruct things in code. Um, and this comes from a code by Peter McCulloch, as I said, it was used in one of these beep modules uh, that is a part of Max that is kind of this modular synth built in. And uh, it, it looks scary. Uh, and I guess it kind of is in some ways. Uh, the language is similar to C, uh, but it's, um, it's sort of its own variant. Um, and there's no real trick to it, I guess. It's just like kind of checking the state uh, of the envelope. Like most envelopes are, are just written like, okay, I get a trigger. Uh, that means I enter the first phase, that's the attack phase. Um, and some envelopes go from the point where they at, some start from zero, these start from zero. So it says, oh, okay, I get a trigger. I'm supposed to enter the attack phase. I go to zero and then I start ramping up um, and uh, I ramp up until I reach one, which is my destination. And that ramp has a, these uh, kind of magic numbers here, as they're called ish, they uh, kind of make the curve, uh, make the attack to a specific curve and stuff like that, which is, you know, maybe a bit too end up to go into, but um, that's essentially what it's doing. So it's like, okay, I've reached attack. Now what do I do? And in this case, uh, it's an attack decay envelope. So um, it just goes to decay and it says, okay, when I reach decay, I am done and it's ready for another trig. But I mean, this is always ready for another trig since it resets. And um, it also has, um, let's see, um, but one thing that's very specific about these envelopes uh, that is also noticeable in live, um, if you hover over over the devices, you'll notice that it has uh, 64 samples of latency. And what these envelopes actually do is for each trigger, they um, they fade out the sound and fade it in extremely quickly to minimize any clicking. Um, and clicking is a sort of common problem in a lot of FM synths. And this is because um, you're dealing with waveforms that typically reset a lot. They, they start from zero. And if you just do that anywhere in a waveform, you get what's called a discontinuity. Basically, you know, you have this smooth sine wave and then suddenly you have a break in that that causes a click. And typically we don't want that. So this envelope fades out and fades in extremely quickly to try and minimize clicks as good as possible. And the delay compensation in live takes care of this, um, this uh, fade in time inherently making a, a little delay to the note and live will sort of correct that. So that's just one of those things that are, you know, uh, in gen just uh, makes it so that um, uh, you can do these very, very, you know, detailed uh, things, which is great. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible. Well, um, you know, maybe it wouldn't have been possible in Max MSP as easily. Um, let's see. Um, so yeah, there's a few different envelopes uh, for, for, you know, uh, different functions. There's the attack attack decay end and you know all these are sort of modifier modified versions of the same which is um quite nice the lfo is is uh 
over here it's kind of got like the same parts it's it's um like a wavetable oscillator actually playing back uh, snippets of waveforms, um, which is usually the cheapest way of, of making an oscillator. Um, um, yeah. That's it for, well, that's not it exactly, but <laughs> that's sort of a little little dip into a doublet. Um, and like <laughs> these crazy clusters over here are, are just to handle like, uh, uh, like the filter and, and uh, uh, the two sides of that. And, you know, um, uh, the, um, the stereo width and the, the um, unison modes and everything and the unison is actually just duplicate voices over here that are minimized as much as possible uh, which is uh, quite costly but you know it, it also makes it sound very good <laughs> so it's always hard um, um, hard uh, balance uh, da, da. Mm. Um, let's exit that and um, I think we should see yeah so yeah that's kind of doublet um, is any of this transferable to something like mono norn or pi uh, norns or pi sound um, probably not they're too CPU intensive um, they are, you could have ever run parts of them on something like the um, the uh, OWL or the uh, DAISY patch, which I have tried a little bit. And it runs quite well. Uh, I haven't tried any of these specifically, but um, um, you can certainly make use of parts of this for something like that. And uh, I mean, the gen stuff builds to C++ actually, but you have to kind of do a lot of <laughs> legwork to make that uh, usable in the end. Um, I think we should probably take a quick look at doublet uh, bokeh too, because uh, this is kind of cool. Um, da, 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 da. um Bokeh has uh, a lot of delay lines and pitch shifters and <laughs> everything uh, up its sleeve. Um, again, these are all custom UI stuff. Uh, it's again JavaScript with uh, the built-in uh, JS UI objects, um, which I think is really handy. It allows you to make nice customized graphics and just gives it a bit of a special experience <laughs> um, and again huge uh, max patch although not as big uh, a little bit messier, messier. <laughs> um, but here we see something that I love using in max and these are the function objects um, these are something I use to scale uh, parameters um, for example if I want like a specific curve to like um, to a knob. Uh, typically you don't want uh, something that is linear, like it goes just in a straight line. You typically want something that is a bit more, um, you know, with volume example, it doesn't scale linearly. Uh, you want something that is logarithmic so it feels natural to turn it. And a lot of these are just making sure the knob, you know, um, something like detune you you want more resolution in the beatings and less resolution when you get to like or you know semitones or or octaves so a lot of these are just scaling knobs to make sure that they feel nice to turn it's also another important part of uh, of uh, of designing a synthesizer and i mean a lot of these knobs uh they have like zero to a hundred but they get converted to other stuff for the underlying synth engine. And this is basically just called normalizing the value. So most of them are like zero to hundred user facing, but you know, it's, it's different under the hood. Yeah. 
Um, 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 again, <laughs> we are working with a big gen patch for the different delays. And this is typically how I, uh, how I you how I work with Max for Live or Max stuff in general. I use the gen as kind of this black box of DSP and then interface it with surrounding stuff. It kind of just, you know, helps keep things neat. And uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a pretty great way of working. Um, releasing any of this as URAC. <laughs> we, we did talk about the bokeh. It would be really cool to have as a URAC module. That would certainly make the most sense in that format, I think. Um, but it might be too uh, CPU intensive. <laughs> um, let's see if we can pull up the gen patch here. It's a little, little big. Da, 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 da. So the gen patch, uh, again, uh, very, very big. Um, where's my scroll bar? Um, or, well, I guess not that big compared to the bokeh. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's it's pretty pretty neat. It, it's actually a very simple reverb, which I think is, is cool because a lot of people like it. But I mean, it's just kind of goes to show that sometimes you don't need extremely fancy uh, algorithms to make stuff that sounds good. Sometimes you just need to put them in a context where it makes sense. So um, the bokeh is kind of a simple setup. It's uh, aside from the pitch shifting that kind of gets wild. Um, but uh, essentially we have these uh, little modules that are the kind of blur and delay in one. And um, when we open that, that up, we'll find kind of a mess of, of uh, something that's called all pass filters. And uh, what those do uh, when they're in series is kind of smooth out the sound. And this is how you build a reverb, essentially. Um, usually you do it a lot nicer than just a straight line of all pass filters. But if you tune them right, it sounds good and it works. <laughs> And uh, a lot of stuff, I think, is down to that. Just listening to things and making sure uh, they sound good. And of course, in that you have to be subjective. And I think that goes along with things. Uh, um, you have to be kind of ready to make a decision on things. You have to be opinionated on what sounds good to make stuff like this, at least in my opinion, because otherwise, you as, end up with something with all the parameters in the world, which is hard to use and hard to get to sound good. Um, and that, of course, changes with, with you know, music and, and culture and everything. What sounds good today might sound bad in the future and, and vice versa. So uh, there's no real magic to bokeh besides the idea behind it, I guess. Uh, the all pass filters are this weird thing where they it's a delay that's kind of taking the previous input and adding it on top and and shifting the face a little bit or something like that. I'm, I'm not great at this, but it just smooths it out. It's, it's really cool. It's kind of like magic. And inside this, we have the shifter at different, you know, uh, the shifter, the pitch shifter is, is there and, and different uh, parts of the patch always are sort of in. Uh, uh, it's very intertwined with the overall architecture, which is, which makes it uh, kind of uh, very flexible. And the, the pitch shifter is actually from the Max examples, <laughs> the Gen examples, which I modified a little bit, and which you know it's it's, it's a totally fair way of, of using this stuff. You should never be afraid of of repurposing stuff that's available to you because. Essentially, as I said before, a lot of this stuff is, is, is known. You can find papers on it and, you know, but, but it's hard to implement something in like C++ from a paper, whereas you can, you know, look at how someone else solved it and kind of get an idea of how you would do it for yourself. Um, yeah. And um, um, then all this is sort of pulled together <laughs> inside this gen patch and... Uh, 
uh, they're then interfaced with uh, in Max and uh, connected together and then uh, you know getting all the colors and all the interface elements that are written in JS and and uh, uh, a lot of a lot of the fluff around this stuff is just making sure stuff gets the right color from live, which is funny. <laughs> um, yeah, um, it's it's. Uh, uh, let's see if there's again this little slider, <laughs> which is very cute. Is is another actual rewrite of the of the built-in or the rather the uh, Ableton knobs. If I remove uh, the, the paint file, it will turn back into a, an Ableton knob. And uh, the tricks like these are, are very useful in Max. You can just kind of, you know, if you, once you start looking into these things, you can really be, like bend the, the program to do stuff you, you, you have in your head, which is cool. And that's, uh, that's bokeh, well, parts of it anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, uh, let's go back to. Um, so yeah, let's maybe. Uh, how long has this been in development? Uh, not that long. <laughs> um, well, I've been building stuff in Max throughout 2020, really, and I would say I built up a library of things, and I built up uh, parts of these, and then sitting down to put it together is not that uh once you have those building blocks sort of um, um it, i mean the the doublet and the bokeh device since the bokeh kind of existed already i made that uh i think the bokeh and doublet devices were like maybe made in a week <laughs> um and the biggest, I mean, the part the the part that took the longest was actually just the interface writing the different um, uh, visualizers. So once you build up sort of a um, sort of a library of things and, and kind of know how to do these specifics, uh, it doesn't have to take that long, you know. Um, um, but the Superberry, you know, took like a month or two. Um, and then sort of the next devices took a bit shorter. And for each one, you know, you, you find methodologies and, and, you know, you find, I don't have to think about how, how things should be maybe laid out or, or look too much because I now I've found like the, the visual identity of things and it just takes shorter to do things, but yeah. Um, Let's do some uh, nice doublet music. The U the UI the UI is slightly reusable, I would say. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for the compliment. Um, it's slightly reusable. Um, you know, I, I certainly reuse a lot of like the tone filter, like the Ganis this filter, like on the. So it's like you know, you use aspects of it and kind of repurpose it a little bit. Um, and some really funny things, like I wanted to do. Um, like when you load up doublet, it, it has this little animation on the screen down here, the voice, uh, if you look at the voice panel, <laughs> kind of boots like a little fake OS, stuff like that. Took quite a while. <laughs> I built like a weird little font renderer almost. Ah, you know, all of this stuff is fun. It just gives uh, things value, you know, uh, kind of gives it. I, I always want things to have like a little identity and a little ethos to it almost. So yeah, I think um, probably we'll do like kind of, yeah, we'll, we'll try doing a kind of um, more of these uh, streams and uh, definitely more like Max stuff, uh, kind of more tutorial-like maybe, or like 
uh, in tandem with those write-ups I want to do for the website. Um, um, it's always nice to stream. The stuff that's doing uh, the high octave shimmer is the bokeh. It's right here. It's the shift thing. Turn that up and it will... So yeah, let's just do like a quick uh, Q&A. And then it's time for me to... Uh, to... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Drink some water. Lie down. Mm -hmm. But it's been really nice to show this off. We're gonna upload this to YouTube. I mean, partly we really wanted to do like a run through and I felt like it would be, <laughs> go to bed. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I felt like it would be nice to, uh, to stream. You know, it's always a good opportunity to hang out with people and, and it's always more fun when it's like interactive. So yeah. Um, and you know, if if you have any like things you would really like to see, uh, now's the time to <laughs> write, and we can think about what to do for like the next time we stream and stuff. Um, You know, maybe, yeah. Yeah, so we, Felicia and I obviously, uh, collaborate on all these things together um, sometimes uh, more sometimes less um, uh, Felicia has been pretty busy with school so like um, uh, the recent after the Superberry was kind of more just me going off on <laughs> some things I wanted to build but um, we always sort of talk about what we think makes sense to make and um, just try and keep things in sort of try and keep things sort of holistic to what we want for, for us to be these sort of kind of simpler more direct instruments that are you know you know uh, more focused and quite you know, beautiful and like maybe you know, not not the most common synth out there. Um, for the Superberry, we collaborated much more on like, you know, what would be nice to have and like, uh, you know, the idea of a super saw and kind of what kind of sounds do we like with that and what do we want to do and sort of sculpting that together by just uh, having uh, very particular <laughs> wishes inside of that, which is always cool. I think a lot of cool instruments are built on just like wanting to make something specific musically yourself, which is cool. And then, you know, we um, sometimes, you know, one of us has an idea and <laughs> a lot of time Philly just like, oh, I really like this type of sound. And I'm like, I could probably make that. And then I like stay up until four and <laughs> just go off on it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really like a, a fun, you know, both being in the sort of music field. It's a really, it feels like, it feels like a very organic thing where these things kind of just happen in a way, which is cool. Um, so a lot of thinking about concept and, and what makes sense to do and, you know, uh, just having an idea of what force should be about. <laughs> if that answers the question. Maybe I went off on a tangent a little bit too. <laughs> um, instrument slash synth dedicated to bass. Um, I mean, uh, uh, any old FM synth should do. <laughs> 
I, I do love the MC202. I mean, uh, um, I can't like think of any like base monster really. I mean, I think the trick is like, it's a specific trick, right? Things that have like, sort of something that comes close to like a sine wave, but still has some overtones, then you'll get like a lot of bass out of it, um, basically, or something that is very rich. And, um, you know, in a, in a sort of analog setting, I would always go for like a self-resonating filter to add oomph to things because, you know, um, but then I have the caveat of analog having some noise in the signal, which, which doesn't make it a perfect sign. Um, and that I think is an important aspect of like something that's really noticeably bassy, because then you get the like, acoustic part of it where you also hear the <laughs> sort of top end with that intense low end. So uh, I don't know which synth is, is like something I would recommend for that, but I think anything where you can sort of introduce harmonics while retaining that like kind of smoother low end is where it's at. Uh, and all, like some little noise or distortion is great for bass, I think. Um, let's see if we can change this up a little bit. Um, new Arvel, uh, <laughs> Lone Tracks Volume 2. I do have Lone Tracks Volume 2 sitting around, but... <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I'm not so... It's maybe not the music I would like to be putting out. I, I haven't really been making... I haven't really been making much music lately. I've been more focused on the instruments, which is quite nice. Uh, are we bookable? I mean, <laughs> I guess... When, when possible, probably. Um, oh, a force imp interpretation of a bass instrument. Yeah, yeah, that would be that would be neat. I uh, I definitely have ideas. <laughs> uh, doublet is great for bass. Yeah, uh, I think um, the trick again to slice in. Uh, you know, uh, can just really quickly. Uh, show like uh oh i had it already up here well um thank god i have that i9a uh, <laughs> um like one thing i always like to do is have this like squarish thing um and uh then applying feedback until it's like noisy mixing it out And then, because <laughs> then you have like, you have like the, with the added psychoacoustics of things, your ear is kind of like, oh, well, the bass is there. <laughs> um, and if you increase like the feedback, so it's like kind of noisy, I think it really, uh, just a little. And then, I mean, another great thing is just adding a this distortion after it or something but yeah um making it sort of squarish and then some feedback and i guess one of these you could kind of oh god that's not very nice but you know <laughs> Um, if you have like more operators, you can you can uh, you can do quite a cool uh, little noisy. But I even for this I. Uh, and of course, making the like classic dubstep basses is all about introducing.
<laughs> as soon as you start making like really overtone rich stuff, it's uh, like introducing wavetables. You you know, but but you have to keep the the mod modulation mod quite low for bass. So otherwise, like the more modulation, the more overtones, or like the more sidebands you have, basically, which is like FM modulation, you start losing bass. Wow. So you want to like keep it pretty low and then, you know. Anyway, <laughs> maybe, 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 maybe uh, a little bass synth in the future or maybe the next synth is just going to be fine for that. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> um, but yeah, okay. Um, I think it's time to go. I think it's time to say goodbye. Um, but this has been really fun and uh, it's really cool that so many people showed up and uh, we're gonna put this on YouTube. I might uh, cut it a little bit to make it, you know, a bit more, uh, so it makes a bit more sense on that format. Um, but yeah, uh, it's been really cool and uh, as always excited for you know releasing more stuff and uh, it's really fun doing this for stuff we're really really happy that it's worked out this way and that people appreciate the stuff and uh, yeah um, you know I think the future holds a lot of cool things uh, for us um, not saying too much, but you know, it's a lot of cool projects in the pipeline and hopefully a lot of them will reach you. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, see you guys and uh, take care. Bye-bye.